Way back in 1967, there was a six-day Arab-Israeli war. And we went to the Methodist church in those days, and a lady in the church said that right prior to Christ's return, there was going to be a war in the Middle East involving Israel. Well, as a teenager, that really got my attention. Went back home, turned on a little grainy black and white television set, and there was the United Nations having an emergency session meeting, debating what was going on in the Middle East. And boy, they were really going at it. And all the world was fearful back then of a Middle Eastern war that would spill over into the big powers, and then maybe we'd have some nuclear conflagration going on, because it was during the Cold War. And those of you who are old enough to remember the Cold War know that you go to bed at night, and if there was a skirmish somewhere, maybe the Soviet Union and its allies would be arrayed against the United States and its allies, and you never knew for sure whether you got up the next morning, whether something got out of hand and you'd have a nuclear exchange somewhere on the earth. Well, the Americans had learned their lesson during the, during the uh, Pacific War with the Japanese, when the Japanese took a surprise attack and took out the American fleet uh, in Hawaii. And so they weren't going to get caught flat-footed again with a nuclear strike. So what they did is had Operation Chrome Dome. They had laden with B-52 bombers, nuclear bombs on them, and it kept them flying 24 hours a day seven days a week. Now, these B-52 pilots were taught to take off with one eye shut. The theory being, you see, if there was a nuclear flash that went off, blinded their good eye, they could still have a reserve eye to complete the takeoff and complete their mission on a retaliatory attack across the Soviet Union. Well, as I was watching the TV in the United Nations debate, I heard the roar of jets outside. You never hear a roar of jets outside in southern Minnesota. Oh, you might see the contrails up there at 35,000 feet. And they would continue, lots of jets. So I ran outside to look. But there was a low, dense cloud cover, and so I didn't see anything. Back to the TV, my, mind racing, because in my mind, those are American bombers going up over Minnesota, up over Canada, down over the South, uh, North Pole, down to the Soviet Union, where it hit their target. Now, my mother had taught us about nucle nuclear blasts. She said, if you see a mushroom cloud off in the distance, what's going to happen is it's going to suck up all the dust and dirt and debris, throw it up into the stratosphere, but it's going to become irradiated with the nuclear explosion. Then those particles are come wafting back down to the earth over the next days and weeks. And if you go outside, everything might look normal on the ground, but you go outside and those little particles are going to shoot up the radioactive effect on you, it's going to hit the nucleus of your cells, your cells are going to die, and you're going to die in a couple of weeks of terrible radiation sickness. So, no parents were home, I was the oldest of four boys, went over to the storm cellar, got it open, got a few canned goods down there, just in case this was going to be a nuclear exchange. I say all that because I was ripe for one of the booklets that the Worldwide Church of God put out. As those of you who are older might remember it, it was called The Book of Revelation Unveiled at Last. And it took passages in the Book of Revelation, and then it illustrated them. There was a member out of Portland, Oregon, who was a nationally known illustrator. He used to write for, or, or illustrate, Cracked Magazine and Mad Magazine, if you recall those. And he's pretty gruesome, but pretty effective illustrations. So I got the booklet, opened up the booklet, and... Uh, those images never strayed away from my mind. I'll show a couple of them to you today. Here was his idea of an ongoing World War III with a nuclear exchange. You see the bodies there in the foreground. And, of course, what happens in a nuclear exchange is that cities don't stay standing very well. But what you do have left standing are some pretty desperate people. And here would be his illustration of that. You can see some men in the very middle trying to light a big fire in the street, trying to keep warm. Now, what do you do with all the bodies? This was a good one. I had a roommate who wasn't in the Church of God. He saw this one. This one stuck in his mind. Well, you see, the bodies can all spread diseases. If you throw them in a canyon somewhere, you get a big bulldozer and you bulldoze over them because you can't have diseases spreading over the people who are left. And then he had an illustration about the sun. Take off from Revelation 16. Something might happen to the sun. Here was his illustration of that. 
And it says, The fourth angel in Revelation 16 poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And here are people trying to tolerate this enormously hot sun. And also in Revelation 16 was another illustration about an earthquake. It said, There was a great earthquake. This is the right part of the return of Christ. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. Now I have to tell you, reading those Revelation passages and looking at these illustrations, it got me. I thought, well, if I'm not going to be alive on the earth, at least I might as well get right with God. That's the only escape that I knew at the time. And so that booklet, I think, was very effective in bringing tens of thousands of others to the same point. I concluded, therefore, that the Church of God used prophecy very heavily and very effectively in its outgoing messaging. And frankly, the conditions in the world at the time seemed to merit it. But there was a downside to this emphasis of prophecy, at least within the church itself. Because in those days, the prophetic sermon messages led members to expect the return of Christ somewhere in the mid-1970s. If you were a teenager in the Church of God, it could seem like every other sermon message had a big focus on prophecy. And from a teenage point of view, that was not a happy occasion because it meant you weren't going to live on your life and have a family and a career. Now, there was a Mennonite lady in the church on the West Coast she was a friend of my mother's, uh, my wife's and mine. And she grew up, life was hard, and she came into the Church of God. It was her 10-year-old daughter, later telling us a story, who was a friend of ours. And her mother went to church, and she'd heard all these sermons on prophecy. Now, in the sermon messages today, to try to get the audience to realize how bad things could be, they would refer to some Old Testament passages. And maybe there was a siege on a city. Maybe it was famine in the land and there was nothing to eat. And there are a couple of places in the Old Testament where it frankly says the people resorted to having to be eating their own children. The mother was a good-hearted person, but she didn't realize what the effect this would have on her 10-year-old daughter when she told her these things. And her 10-year-old daughter was horrified. You wouldn't do this, would you, Mommy? Would you? But the mom had never fully thought through what this might mean to the psyche of a 10-year-old girl. And so she was silent. Imagine what that did to a 10-year-old girl's mind. Mom might eat me if times get real bad. So because Christ did not return in those days, we've raised an entire generation of church members, those who were teenagers back in those days. And frankly, they have no warm and fuzzy feelings about the topic of biblical prophecy. No, thank you. They'd rather live without it. And so in prophecies being discussed within the church these days, the church often finds itself on the defensive because it has to make a distinction what, what it is saying today is different from the little boy who falsely cried wolf. And so compared to decades past, sermon messages and prophecy today have really fallen out of favor by comparison. Now, Having said all of this, I'd like to relate an experience that my wife and I had at the feast this past year in Colorado. We were with some friends, old friends we'd known since we were age 20. Very simple, modest restaurant we were at. We were having a great time talking about old memories. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed another table about 15 feet away. And there was a man and his wife, not Church of God people. But they weren't talking with each other much at all. And our conversation got to the topic of prophecy. Silly ideas from the past. And then biblical passages, we wonder, how are these things going to play out in the future? And we got quite serious about sharing all our opinions and how things were going to play out. And then the topic turned on to some other topic. The man at the other table stood up, walked over to our table, and he had an earnestness in his voice. He'd been listening, apparently. And he looked at our table, and he looked right at me, and he said, but you haven't talked about the red heifer. You haven't talked about the red heifer. Turns out he was in his mid-40s. He was an evangelical Christian. His father used to be a, a, a preacher. 
And he really wanted to know about the red heifer and discuss it. So we made a place for him at our table and he sat down. We had exchanged some pleasant ideas for a while. Now, a heifer, if you've grown up on a farm or know anything about it, a heifer is a female. A heifer is a, a female that has never yet had a baby. In human terms, you'd say it's like a teenage girl. She's not yet become a mom. And the Bible only talks about the red heifer in one place. It's way back in Numbers chapter 19. I'll turn to that in a few minutes and put it on the screen. But I'll summarize it for you first. In Numbers 19, God told uh, the Israelites to bring the ashes of a red heifer. You actually collect the red heifer. Then you would sacrifice it. Nobody could see the meat on this one. Just sacrificed. You take all of the ashes that are left. Then you get some big jars of spring water. Spring water could never be touched with human hands. And you put this big pile of ashes in this jars of spring water. And that would be used for ritual cleansing of the priests or anything involving the temple. It didn't biologically clean you anyway, but it was a reminder of the priest would be unclean, let's say, if he touched a dead body. So now I'll turn to Numbers chapter 19, and we'll just read the first two verses out of there <clears throat> to get the sense of it. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is a requirement of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish and that has never been under a yoke. So even in Jesus' day, if a priest came into contact with a dead body, he needed the water mixed with the red heifer's ashes to make him ceremonially cleansed. Now, all of you, of course, are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus said a man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And now if you go down there, there's some huge boulders, size of a house, all lined along the way. Good place for thieves and robbers to hide. So in Jesus' parable, it said the man fell amongst thieves. And they stripped him of his clothing. You know, you... Clothing's expensive in those days. You just run down to Walmart, get something to throw on. And they beat him and left him for dead. And then the next instance in the story of Jesus is that a priest comes along. Remember the story? Sees the man lying there at the side of the road. And he passes by on the other side of the road and continues on his journey. Now the theory being that the priest, he should have gone over and helped the man, right? If he did, and he picks him up, the man turns out to be dead. Now the priest is unclean. Can't do, do his job in the temple anymore. He's got to be isolated for seven days, kind of like reminder of the early days of COVID. And he's got to have the ashes of the red heifer mixed with the spring water to ceremonially cleanse him before he can go in the temple and do his job again. Now the Jewish tradition, not the Bible, but the Jewish tradition says that from the days of Moses until the time of Jesus, only nine red heifers were ever slaughtered. And the implication was that these red heifers are exceedingly rare. And they had to be without blemish. And in their judgment, they can mean no white hairs, no black hairs. Even the hooves of the animal have to be red. Today we would say it's a red Angus breed. But since the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD, there have been no red heifers ever found or sacrificed. Now, Orthodox Jews thought they found one back in 1997. And then again in the year 2002. But as the heifers grew, they got inspected, lifted up the tail, and there's a little couple of white hairs growing under the tail. Heifers are disqualified have to be red heifers in their judgment. Now, what does any of this have to do with Christians? We don't use priests, and we certainly don't have animal sacrifices, right? But you see, the 45-year-old evangelical Christian man in Colorado knew the relevance to Christians. So I thought I would talk about the red heifer today. And the starting point for understanding is the fact that religious Jews view the coming of their Messiah as simply being human. Not somebody divine like Jesus, not somebody who came down from heaven, just a man. 
And a man, you know, like King David was a man. And their belief is that when the Jewish Messiah comes, whenever he does come, he will have to enter an existing physical temple. And they will point to Old Testament scriptures that to them mandate that a temple is necessary in order for the Jewish Messiah to come. Can't have a functioning temple without priests. And the priests are no good unless they're first cleansed. Well, how do you do that? With the ashes of a red heifer. No ashes, no clean priests, no functioning temple. You got to have a red heifer to start the whole process. Now, even then for Jews, you have other problems. You have first to own the Temple Mount, where Solomon's temple stood and later Herod's temple stood, the one that Jesus walked in. But religious Jews have not had access to the Temple Mount for 1,900 years. Here's an aerial photo shot of what the Temple Mount looks like today. 46 acres. The temple used to stand upon that retaining wall area. So for 1,900 years, religious Jews have had no access to the Temple Mount area. In fact, they didn't even own Jerusalem. They didn't even have a country. Talk about impediments to the coming of the Jewish Messiah. But as you know of history, after the Holocaust and World War II, no nation would take in all these Jewish refugees, not even the United States. What are you going to do with all these tens of thousands of people? Nobody wants them. So the United Nations took up the cause. They had a big, contentious argument over it. And they finally resolved that they're going to vote on whether to create a new nation in the old geographical area of Israel that had been there for 1,900 years. And they had a contentious vote. You can imagine the Arabs were not happy. And it passed with one vote. Ironically, it was the Soviet Union who cast the deciding vote. And so for the first time in 1,900 years, Jews had their own nation. Now, they still didn't own all of Jerusalem. They only owned one half of Jerusalem. The half where the Temple Mount stood was owned by the Jordanians and the Palestinians, and it was under complete Muslim control. Now, religious Jews consider the Temple Mount area the most holy place on the face of the earth for them. A couple of years ago, I was there. We had a Jewish tour guide. He was secular. It wasn't religious, but he was raised in an ultra-Orthodox family. He took us up to the Temple Mount area and he said, now you guys can go up there. You can walk up there wherever you like. I'm just going to stay right here. And then he explained. He said, even though I'm secular, I was raised with an Orthodox family, and my father and my brother still are. And he said, out of respect for them, I will not go up in the Temple Mount lest I inadvertently step on the place where the Holy of Holies was. Now, Jews can go up, but they cannot pray up there these days. That changed in 1967. Uh, that's when the Six-Day War was. The Israeli army parachuted soldiers into the half of the city they didn't own, the place where the Temple Mount was. In a memory serves, they lost 170 men fighting their way to capture the eastern half of the city. And they made it to the Temple Mount. First time in 1900 years. There's an iconic photo that came out because of that. Here are the soldiers reaching what's called Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall, as it's called nowadays. And the eyewitnesses said the soldiers there were so overwhelmed, they began to cry, and they could not speak in coherent sentences. It was such a powerful moment for them. One of the Israelis grabbed the Israeli flag, put it up on the top of the Dome of the Rock. You see the Golden Dome up there, which is Islam's third most holy site. And you remember back in those days, there was a general with one eye patch named Moshe Dayan, he heard about it 30 minutes later, he said, get that thing down. You want a war with one billion Muslims on the earth? So they pulled down the flag. And the way to keep the peace was, even though Israel now owned the whole city and the Temple Mount, they left the Jordanians on control on the top of the Temple Mount. They're Muslim, and the stipulation is no Jews can go up there and pray. Be Jewish and go up there, but you cannot pray. That doesn't stop the religious Jews from trying. Now, you've seen pictures where religious Jews against the Wailing Wall, and they've got their headgear on and the whole thing, and they're, they're bobbing back and forth with their, their prayer book. Well, that's a sign of intensity. 
right? They're really getting intensity when they're praying to God. So some of them will put on normal street clothing, go up on the Temple Mount area, pick a coin out of the pocket, no one's looking, pretend to drop the coin. And they go down, they're, they're, they're praying. But the Jordanian beefy guys come running over, they know the drill, grab them and escort them off the Temple Mount site. Now in the year 2000, the Israeli Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon, not a religious man, but he's Prime Minister, and he said, forget all this. And he went up on top of the Temple Mount with his entourage. I don't know how long he stayed up there, but enough to create a huge political stir. And the Palestinian in that area went absolutely bananas. They started a second round of what they call the Intifada. They would put on suicide vests filled with explosive, put another jacket over them to kind of disguise it, and they would go into city buses filled with people, flick their little switch, blow themselves and the whole bus up. This is a protest for what Ariel Sharon did going up on the Temple Mount. Then they would go to pizza shops where Jewish kids would freak in on a Friday night. Same routine. Flick the switch and blow the whole area up. They go to expensive hotels where a Jewish wedding was going on. Go into that first floor, get in there quickly, flip the switch. The only way that the Israelis could stop it, after a lot of effort, was to build a huge fence, 30 feet high, security fence, along the area where the suicide bombers were likely to come from. And eventually the well, the fence is going to be 430 miles, but it did stop the suicide bombing. Now, in America, we have something of a cultural divide today. Some even call it a cultural war. You've heard the expression woke. Those would be people who favor a woke policy, typically left or center politically. They do not get along with those who are right of center politically, who would consider themselves conservative. These two do not see eye to eye. Well, that helps us understand something similar is going on in the state of Israel today, because fully half of Israelis are secular, not religious at all. One half of them are. The 13% that are ultra-Orthodox, you've seen pictures of them before. They've got the black hats on, the black uh, outfit on top, black uh, pants on, even in the heat of the summer over 100 degrees, and they don't cut their sideburns. Up, so they curl them up because otherwise they get rather inconvenient to walk around. These are the ultra-Orthodox. They are the ones who are in favor of building the third temple. Now the secular Israelis think it's an insane idea because they know it would set off the whole Muslim world and create a war. They want nothing to do with that. So uh, one has to assume that because of the division in Israel, there is not going to be soon an agreement to vote to build a third temple within Israel itself. Something else would have to occur before a third temple is ever constructed. Now, a couple of years ago, some of the Orthodox Jews began searching in earnest for a red heifer. And they met a man who was an American, happened to be from Texas, who was an evangelical Christian. And a man that was a businessman, he'd been to Israel 80 times, huge number of times. And his curiosity got the better of him, and he introduced himself to the ultra-Orthodox, and they came to trust him. He came to trust, didn't agree on the Messiah. They put that aside and got along with each other. So he's back in Texas one day, and he gets a call from the ultra-Orthodox. He says, we need your help. We want to find a red heifer. We don't have many cattle in, in uh, Israel. We're a small country. You're from Texas. They've got cattle we hear. Can you help us find a red heifer? He said, well, I'll see what I can do. So he put in full-page uh, advertising and ranching and farming magazines and didn't get any response. So he changed tactics. He went on direct mail, you know, get letters in the mail. And one day he got a call from a rancher, small rancher, said, I think I may have something that you might be interested in. Went out and had a look. Turns out the man had been breeding his reddest cows to the reddest bulls that he could find. They had red hooves. It looked like they might fit the bill. Well, that and some other leads caused the uh, Texas man, show a picture of him for a moment, there's a Texas businessman, caused him to contact the Orthodox rabbis, and they came over to America, and they did his inspection of these red heifers. And it looked like they had nine candidates. Right? Passed all the inspection. Boy, were they excited. Except... When a calf is born, 
in order to show that they've been vaccinated, they'll take like a fat bobby pin wide, put it on a little handheld device, and clamp it on the ear of the animal. Because you can't have them spreading diseases, and everybody knows that particular animal will not spread diseases because it's been vaccinated. And what it does is it leaves a mark in the ear, a little scar, or a little hole. You remember the animal, the red heifer, has to be without blemish. You can't have white hairs and black hairs, and you can't have a blemish. You can't have them, except for some of the heifers did not have an ear tag. The man who was scheduled to come and do it that day had COVID, and he never made it. Here were five red heifers that seemed to fit the bill. Well, he got everybody excited. Got them all the way to New York, filling out the paperwork to get the animals into Israel. Big problem. Israel's like the United States. They don't want some other country's diseases coming in, like tuberculosis and brucellosis and these communicable diseases and destroying all the cattle in Israel. Cannot bring any foreign animals into their country. So they went back to the drawing board, looked at the fine print for the Israeli requirements. There was an exception. You can bring in an animal from another country as long as it's categorized as a pet. So five red heifers are now pets and landed in the Tel Aviv airport three weeks before the feast this past year. That's what the evangelical Christian knew about, and that's why he was all excited about it. First time in 1900 years, you now have red heifers in Israel that qualify. Now, someone may think, well, that may be fine and good. It's interesting, but so what? And I would agree with you except for Jesus and Daniel and Paul. We'll look at three passages today. First one is Matthew 24 and verse 15. Matthew 24 and verse 15. Now let me set this up for you first. Jesus and the disciples are coming out away from the temple where they've just been. There's huge Herodian stones, not even on the temple, but on the retaining wall around it. Sometimes they weigh 60... 60,000 pounds. The disciples are country boys for the most part. They're fishermen up north. They say, Master, do you see the, ra- see the uh, size of these stones and the workmanship? And Jesus appears to have said rather casually, I tell you, not one stone should be left on top of another one. I have to imagine if I were one of the disciples, that would be a shocking statement. This thing was a jewel of the Middle East, said the, the Jewish historian Josephus. And not only being a beautiful place, but it was what Jesus called, remember, when he cleansed the temple, my father's house. This was the center of his ready life. So for Jesus to make a casual statement that there's going to be no stone one left upon another has to grab your imagination. And then they walked up to a big hill. The big hill is only a third of a mile from the temple mount. We call it a big hill. They call it the Mount of Olives. And one can imagine them pondering this statement of Jesus, how in the world is this going to make out? And the, the text records that when they get to the top of Mount of Olives, by the way, you can turn around, you can see the Temple Mount and a whole city on display. You see everything. You can see the sacrifices going on in the outer uh, court. God could have Gentiles looking up there and see what was going down uh, in his religion. And then they asked the question of Jesus, tell us, when are these things going to be and the sign of your coming? And Jesus now answers a question. At least one of the statements in his question. Here's one of his responses. Therefore, when, notice the term, when you see the abomination of desolation, whatever that means, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, we're going to get to Daniel in a minute. Standing, did you see that word? Standing where? In the holy place. Mind you, they're looking from the Mount of Olives right down on the temple. They know where the holy place is. They know where the holy of holies is. Is there any doubt in their mind what Jesus is talking about? No, I don't think that it would be. Now, because Jesus said about Daniel, what Daniel had written about, we'll go back and look at it. Daniel had a vision. What was going to happen in the end of the age? And Daniel wrote it down. And Daniel writes, Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices. Wait, 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 wait. If they're 
you're going to take away the daily sacrifices. That means there have to be daily sacrifices in order for someone to take them away, right? There's no daily sacrifices since 70 AD. They haven't owned the Temple Mount, haven't even had a country. The implication is, and it's hard to get around, that there's going to be at some point in the future daily sacrifices of animals that someone's going to come in and take away. That's what Daniel's referring to. They shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there, and here comes that term again, the abomination of desolation. And now we have one further witness to add today, and that's the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is going to talk about the same thing that Jesus and Daniel have just, we've just quoted. It's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Now I'll set this up for you. Paul had written a prior letter called 1 Thessalonians to us, and the Thessalonians got quite excited about the return of Christ. So excited that some of them stopped working, more than a few. What's the point of working and gathering food for the winter if Christ is going to come in here in a couple weeks or months? And so Paul had to write a second letter, a corrective letter. He said, no, 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 no. Something else has to happen before the return of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3. I'll put it on the screen. That day, meaning Christ's return, won't come unless the rebellion comes first. And the person who is lawless is revealed, who is headed for destruction. And then the next verse elaborates on it. Same individual. This individual who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Imagine someone, this would be today, if we take it literally, above Allah, above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, and what does this guy do? So that he sits as God, where? In the temple of God. There's no temple there today. In the temple of God, and this one will blow your mind, showing himself that he is God. It's a man. He's conned the world thinking that he is God. Whether it's the Father or the return Christ, I'm not certain. But he has bewitched people on the earth of miracles. And what does this guy do? Goes into the Temple Mount, presumably into the Holy of Holies, into the Temple, sits there, and he's worshipped as God. I would suggest to you that that is a really good candidate for making the place unclean and being the abomination in God's eyes that makes that whole place desolate. And it's a great rebellion toward the God of heaven to have all these people on earth worshiping a man. By the way, the man, I believe, has a consciousness of guilt because he knows he's not God. And he ends up, we find in the book of Revelation, in the lake of fire destruction. That means he has have gotten to know, not just to be himself deceived, and he does it anyway. And why the, te- the verses here call it the great rebellion at the end of the age. Now, before a third temple is built, in my opinion only, I'm going to guess there has to be some kind of war in the Middle East to shake things up. It's only my opinion, but there is precedent for this because nobody would have thought in 1939 that Israel would have their own country, own half the city of Jerusalem. But a few short years later, after the Holocaust and World War II, you end up now in 1948 that the Jews have their own country. It took a war to do it. And then in 1967, it took another war before the Israelis could capture the entire city where the Temple of Mount was. It's my own suspicion. It will take something on the order of war in or- before religious Jews will receive permission to build and re- temple and restart the daily sacrifices. Now, somebody might say, okay, fine and good, but how does this, we're sitting here today, how, how does this edify Christians today? Well, Jesus appeared to have something to say about it. We'll look in Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 28. Now, we talked a few minutes ago about Jesus being on the Mount of Olives in the book of Matthew. Jesus is still there, only Luke is recording it at this time. Here's what Luke, here's what Luke records Jesus saying. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. 
I take it that the world's not going to be a pretty place or happy place for Christians in those days. And it appears that Jesus meant this phrase for encouragement. You see these things begin to happen? Uh, look up. Lift up your head, for your redemption draws near. Why did God put these prophecies in the book? Is it so you could have a head start and make a killing in the stock market when things start going haywire? My sense is that God put these signposts of prophecy there for your and my benefit. He deliberately put them there so that we are not caught, are you ready? Spiritually unprepared when he comes back. That's the whole point. He gives us a heads up so we're not caught spiritually unprepared. Now, I have no idea when Christ is going to return. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I thought, hey, I've got a long time to live. It's going to be my lifetime. I'm persuaded. And as the years and decades roll by, think, you know, I have my serious doubts here. But surely in my children's lives, surely they're going to live a long time. And I really mean that. Yeah, it's going to happen in their life. But I have no idea. The fact is that these red heifers may grow at age three, someone checks them out, and they got some white hairs growing under the tail. Or the secular Israelis know what this might imply. They, under cover of darkness, they go out and oft those heifers. We're not going to have war with the Muslims on the earth. But the evangelical Christian man in Colorado knew the relevance of the red heifer for Christians. The red heifer's arrival in Israel after the absence of 1,900 years, makes it a good time to take the words of Jesus seriously. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near.